Hello again. Good afternoon. I hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, people attending live and people running off to have a sandwich maybe at home and looking at our, uh, our Zoom. Um, it's a privilege to have the opportunity to talk to two lovely people and, and we talked for the last half an hour. So I hope we, we don't feel we've said it all before uh, even starting the discussion. Um, anyway, what I took kind of home or to lunch this, this afternoon or this lunch was really like, do we need this kind of legal entity? Was a, a question popping up. And then I talked to uh, the two experts are going to be talking to me in, in, in a few moments. And, and we've got different reasons to say yes, but still there's a bit of no as well. And, and this brings me to the theme of the round table, which is all about friction. And I think this is kind of what we're kind of discussing and, and, and researching. There is, of course, friction going on. There's no, there's no one size fits all. There's no easy solution, but uh, we're all kind of trying to get uh, together to talk about what the uh, solutions could be. So it's, it's very interesting to see what uh, my next speakers are gonna be talking about. First of all, uh, it's, it's going to be two presentations and then Q&A after the second one finishes. So we've got Mirichelle Chavez, and she's uh, connected to the Charm University as an alliance. Um, I, I should say she's all, all, all as well involved in 4EU. Um, that is kind of um, an, an over um, an organization that's really trying to group all the alliances currently uh, designing. But she's not going to be really talking from that point of view so it's going to be more a person point of view and from what how she feels her alliance is is, is moving on and and secondly uh, uh dr um dana uh, uh samson is uh, connected to the circle u if i'm not mistaken and i had a very good talk uh, previously and uh, yeah we're my fellow belgian let's say um colleague here i'm very happy to uh, to welcome her as well and she is uh, trying she's going to explain maybe something similar but then again not that what we've heard today from una europa from uh, from emily palmer they have just uh, uh, well not really just they started they established this isbl the thing that we're trying to establish as well within FilmEU. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to both of them. But first of all, I give the floor to Marichel for her uh, presentation. Thank you. It's OK. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I think well, I am here with two hats, like Barbara. Uh, one is uh, I am the CharmEU Alliance Manager. Uh, but I am also the chair of the governance and legal framework for you one. Okay, so I will make one part about uh, what is doing the forum about this matter, and the second I will explain you the charming journey about this. Not I will not speak about all uh, we are doing in charm because I can speak for two days. So this I, I will uh, avoid this for you. And I will give you my personal view, so only myself to be the guilty one, uh, about some of the matters that uh, Mark has uh, think about for the debate. So um, the universities, the, the wave one, that is the 17 alliances is for you one, and the 24 uh, second wave are for you two, okay? This uh, came as a proposal in March, 2020, to join forces, to have an informal channel, and he, it has been a very good idea. We have a great relation, uh, very open and collaborative, surprising. We are competing somehow, but we are more collaborative than com competitors, okay? It has been extremely useful for sharing, for uh, making positions. Uh, someone asked for that. Uh, I think it was you. Uh, if the, if, if uh, strengthening uh, this type of uh, actions was good or not, uh, we don't share all the positions. But when we share one, it's a strong one. Okay. So I think, and when we don't share the position, we say that some of us are in this position, and the legal entity is one of that. Okay. Um, we have different subgroups, European degree, legal entity, multilingualism, uh, project management, 
very interesting too. I am not sure if for you have one, but we exchange the, the, the answers of the officers. And this has provided uh, <clears throat> several heart attacks in the proposal phase, okay? Uh, learning something 10 days before the, the proposal, but it's been very useful. So I think we need to keep that, okay? Uh, uh, and and we, we, we are invited to also address to the commission individually. So there is no problem at all, but we are stronger uh, together. But the stronger not in front of the commission, stronger because we share a lot of things that are happening. Um, this is the uh, terms of reference. So this is what we uh, put in the table to do together, benchmark, uh, to avoid each alliance uh, going to the same people. For example, if this was the case, EUCOR by now, that is the EGTC uh, only university model that exists in Europe has been contacted by 41 alliance. So this was one uh, of the things to identify the barriers and try to uh, discuss it internally, but also uh, with commission uh, to define why we want a legal entity. One of the questions that he mentioned and um, to, to do this co-creation process, okay? And we had joined forces with the 24 Alliance. Uh, I, um, I attend regularly, more or less, to the, uh, to the subgroup of, uh, of, uh, for you two on legal entity and Dana uh, attend our meetings. So some facts. So um, we have 17 alliances, one, two members, some of them three, in the group um, and uh, the same in the second, we are cross. Um, some have reached to the conclusion and this, this is something from the first year, okay? Some reach the conclusion that they need a legal entity. Many of them have uh, are, or are analyzing or go through the association. And what is clear, and this is, a, this is why there are differences, that uh, all our missions are connected because of the call. All of us pointed our missions to the purpose, okay? But how we produce the vision is different. So not, not, not all of us uh, have the same way to understand this. So this imp implies that we have some common points, but some very different aims to, to get. Uh, what we agree, this is the common ground we have, that we need governance, and I will explain it later. This is not a project anymore, or I strongly believe this, or I have experienced it. Uh, so we need governance that is in the center. Uh, many of the alliances want an identity to, to promote the, 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 the alliance and the, the the capacity and the strength that we have. Um, human resources hiring and sharing. Uh, this is something that also appeared this morning, apart from the model that uh, Barbara explained, that is a little bit different. Um, to share infrastructures. Uh, there are, uh, there are um, universities that have started with this, but there is something that all of us need is IT infrastructures. And so this is a need that is already there. And a sustainability, and I, I like the image because it's sustainability, not only financial sustainability, but also transparency, okay? To be, um, to be funded with projects with different rules where the money goes to the, each partner and they have all the autonomy to do that is not so transparent, okay? So I think these kind of things need to be. Um, the big question mark is these alliances need to be able in a legal entity to provide an award in Europe, an official one. And, and I, I will jump for this at the end of, the, of my presentation. So this is something that I, I use to 
Dana and myself were invited to talk to the contractors that are doing the analysis of the legal entity on the research part, because this is another thing. Uh, the the DGEAC and the DGR, so educational research, try to go in the same row, in the same way, but for them, it's not so easy, as it's not easy for us to go. Uh, and the, the forms need to uh, try to explain that we, the, the existing tools, are not supporting the idea of we are a university and we are an alliance. So we have different, different sources with different rules, with different periods of the projects. And we have our national and own legislations. And we are trying to combine all, all of this. Uh, and it's difficult, OK? It's difficult. And we have in the group of the 17 alliances, I think we have two main groups. One that is providing or aiming for collaboration and others, and it's the case of CHARM, that are thinking in a really sound integration. That means no merging the universities, okay? That this is important. To work together in a, in a more sound way and more integrated doesn't mean that we want to, I mean, do you think that uh, Utrecht and Barcelona will merge in one university? No. So uh, it's, this is an example, no? Um, some other things that uh, I wanted to explain, what we have done in this uh, and what benefits uh, the group has, we are in a very clo close connection with the European Commission. They ask, they send us documents, we can give our opinion. So if you want to call it lobby, it can be, okay? Because uh, we are we are listening. They want us close and we are, okay? Um, we are now uh, in a standby waiting and see, and, and as a group, okay? Waiting for the discussion with the member states, the last uh, information, I think it was, there was a meeting 10 of February or something like that. Uh, and there are state members that are very fond of the idea, others compl completely against, okay? But this is a uh, keep. <clears throat> there is this study about the legal entity. Well, the thing is that there are two studies, one in education and other in the research area. We have asked many times to go together. They are trying, okay? But uh, we will not have the results until the end of 2022. We are individually reached by the contractors to know which are the reasoning of each alliance. And um, we have the legal entity pilot that will be launched in June. It will be demanding pilot because they expect that the, the aliens that uh, do that first uh, go for an international uh, European legal type. So those of you that has gone for a national one cannot participate in the pilot. Uh, the legal entity needs to be established before the end of 2023. But I think if you are not in the in the path already must be something impossible. So, and of course, why give us time to, to write a proposal? It would be published in June and it needs to be uh, submitted by middle September, okay? We ask, it cannot be different and they say, no, okay. Uh, I think we have evolved very quickly. At the beginning, two alliances already have a, a, a legal entity. Una Europa was one that created it for the purpose. Uh, ECIU was another that was coming from the past, but they, they know that they need to reformulate because it, it doesn't, it is not useful for what they are doing. Um, but others have moved now quickly, okay? Uh, Utopia, I think it'd be cool is another. So the, the, some alliances has, are not going to wait because it's something that we need instrumentally. 
logistics, basically. Okay. Uh, so the group has moved the focus because legal entity is something important, but governance is more important. With or without a legal entity, we need a, a sound governance uh, model. Okay. So we are uh, sharing which which type of legal entities. So this is what about for you, and I will explain you which. Uh, which is because we have not uh, end the, the 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 path the, the journey in charm these are the the partners okay of charm EU, but we are expanding as many of you okay uh, so we will have a big family of eight uh, so this is more challenging okay and this is what we try to 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 make in these three years, and I explained this to you for giving you context of what uh, the discussions about the legal entity. Charmi said, we want to design everything from the scratch to meet the purpose. So we said, we don't want to put a governance model on the table from the beginning, because we want to design it for the purpose. So you see on, on, the, on the left side, uh, there are all the pieces. And one of the pieces is the governance model. So the idea is we are going to build everything from the scratch, of course, build in the strengths of the alliance, and we are going to pilot in a master. And we always have the people saying, so your alliance is doing a master. And we say, no, the master is the proof of concept, the proof of concept of everything, of the mobility schemes, but also from the governance model. For what? For piloting, refining, and scaling. So we have the idea to keep it small, to learn, and we have learned a lot uh, in order to uh, have the, the, the second period with, uh, with a more sound um, way of doing the things. What we did, August 2019, we started the, the official project in November 2019. Rector's assembly, we don't want a legal entity, <laughs> not at all. And I would say something, we have a French university, okay? The French universities has, have suffered a lot with the merge. They have merged, they have been obliged to merge. In the, so they don't want to, know, to, to, to hear about something that can smell to a, another merge or another legal entity, okay? So they, they don't want to do that and say, except that you come and say, there is no other way. By March 2020, in the middle of the pandemics, uh, we were convinced that we have no other way around. We were trying to go for the accreditation with countries that a European approach was even unknown. Uh, and we thought it was really very complicated to Manage from the from the legal aspect, from uh, from rules and regulations, and so on. We did an, an analysis of different instruments: the, the European Group for Territorial uh, Cooperation, the ERIC, uh, the associations, and so on. And uh, what we end is uh, with a definition of the principles that we want in that entity. Okay. And we were, we did this best practice report. I am not going to do through this. You have it in the in the presentation. But this was what we selected from the different types. So probably this this combination doesn't exist. Okay, but this was the principles that the alliance want to to have, and the conclusions of the of the best report. And we compare different things. I compare different institutions, EUCOR, uh, EIT, so the KICS uh, model, and so on, that we wanted to build this from the existing governance. We didn't want something completely different. And, and I, I imagine that the, the alliances, all of you have, uh, if, if you are in this path, have discussed what happened? Are we creating a son daughter that is going to be independent and we are going to lose the control and the autonomy? No, no way. Okay. 
um, we we have um, taken a living strategy. So we, we think that Charm is a lab, a lab of innovation. We try things. We are more flexible for trying things that can be adapted or imported at home, but also change. Okay, learn and and uh, how it's uh, wrong it's error and and yeah. Uh, build the complementarity of the of the partners. Um, balance inclusiveness and flexibility and and um, Emily has mentioned this this morning inclusivity excellence inclusivity and a project funding is not a good combination okay uh, focus on the financial sustainability this is a, a worry of all our institutions are we going to create something that is not sustainable no way um, and that facilitate this network networking in the institution. She also mentioned that this morning, no, to to enhance this collaboration, to enhance quality. Okay. Um, so we arrive to the uh, to to the the matter that legal entity can be an asset or not, and we are not still in a clear uh, position. And the thing is, this support the long term. Uh, of the alliance this is something beneficial for and for what okay so uh, this is our this was our position in 2020 end of 2020 our model as i explained was design integrate test and refine but covid didn't allow us to do that because the best practice was impossible I was explaining one of the benchmarks was, for example, Sanofi, because they are a multinational with different regulations, very strict, because they are in the, in the pharmaceutical sector. But the other was one world alliance of planes, because we said they had different prices, different procedures, different legal entities, how they work. But imagine one world alliance would happen in March, they say we are not going to be to, to receive you online okay but um what we did uh, is to develop those processes that we could test in the in during the project okay the accreditation the academic rules and regulations different from all our countries and all our universities unique fees uh joint budgeting um, academic staff allocation system. So how we decide who is going to teach in the master, how we are going to be balanced, who is going to govern this process, each institution or the alliance, no? Examples, uh, joint academic structures. Okay, we have developed that. We have developed joint management structures. We have a uh, uh, joint virtual administrative office. The people was hired to to be part of this uh, unit. We have not a legal entity. I am the boss of five people hired for this, but I have no direct competence on the um, labor conditions or the holidays or the amount of tasks they can do. Uh, joint quality system joint GD, gdpr statements this is a nightmare nightmare half a page for registration process so all of us have registration process and all of us have statements three months of negotiation so this is not sustainable okay and the joint it systems we try to go for a unique digital identity digital identity i mean you know the provider of the uh, email the provider of um, microsoft because you know by now that connecting five or six systems of microsoft different it's no not working at all so this was the test that we that we use and this is what happens so um 
when we, so the model is a deliverable of the current project. And of course we need to put something in the proposal. We cannot say in the second proposal, well, we are going to put the governance for the purpose during the project, okay? But uh, more important than that, I said to the rectors, I cannot manage this. We have going from 20 people to more than 300 with a project structure that is, uh, how to say, very standard project management teams, corporate leaders, but this is not working anymore. When you become real and do real things that were not written as deliverables, were not exactly planned, everyone's looked to the other side, okay? Someone has a responsibility to do that, okay? So uh, we have builders, designers, but now we need to consolidate. We need to put order, have procedures if we, if we want to scale. And we, have a, we want to have a flat organization, has no sense. But all of us have organizations with people with high qualification, with thousands of good ideas, a lot of initiatives. I think Barbara also mentioned that, okay? How you keep aligned a flat organization. If you don't have a, a strong governance, you cannot do that. Okay. So this was not only a matter of delivering in the first project or preparing the proposal, it was a, mass, a matter of uh, subsistence and sustainability. So we, we, we uh, prepared the model. Um, it's integrated with the partner universities. Each member has two sides. It has a role in charm but it has a role at home. And I would not say which is more important, okay? Um, flat organization, this idea of test and uh, adapt or, uh, or change, uh, we need a sound decision-making process. When you have the project management team, the work package leaders, this is perfect. When you start with boards, the academic board, the, some boards that the, the legislations of our universities need, you lose the, the control of who is deciding what. And you cannot bring everything to the rector's table. Um, also clear mandates. And I am sure you have experienced this. In some groups, there are universities that work, in others, no. There are universities that deliver better and others that don't, okay? So if we are a real university, we cannot be like this. In a project, well, the project starts and ends and you can manage. Uh, in a long-term run, uh, you need clear mandates and clear dedications. Uh, with this idea of uh, co-creation with all the external stakeholders and uh, integrating education, research, and service, service to society. We are not thinking about a governance that reproduce the fragmentation at home because we want to integrate these functions. And important transdisciplinary and interculturality are central values of charm. So uh, we did this integrate university. I will explain it later. We have in the center the knowledge creating teams that is, are the, the groups of uh, academic staff, uh, external stakeholders and students. We, we have put the seat of that. We have around 60 core people, around 200 on the, on the second circle. And they are also working in the research dimension. So this is the point where both dimensions get together, also in the executive board. And also uh, something similar that uh, um, Emily explained this morning, we have some units that have become units, work packages that started as work package, that are units now, that are, um, are composed by people from that function in each university. 
experts. For example, communication. It was one word package, but now it's a unit making all the communication. And it's one person from Barcelona, one from Trinity, with a partial time destined to that. They produce common strategy and common activities, but also they are the ones with the role to integrate this in the strategy of the university. So promotion of the programs, they produce the, the promotion for charm, but then they, they put this in the channel of each institution. Uh, and some full-time positions as also Emily said. Um, this uh, is the explanation of why the role is double. So the rectors of course are the ones approving the strategy, the financial aspects, and so on. And they have a ro an important role aligning this at home. If charm goes in this way and in the institutions go in the other, this is not working. And also they are the ones responsible of the internal transformation. The same of the director. So they have a, a clear role in the strategy and in the new, in the new, in this governance model, each director will have a mandate of one area of charm. Okay, now they were mainly positioned here. So they were in the boards saying, my institution can do that or not, or maybe we need the resources, but they have no, um, no responsibility for the global thing. And the charm participants also have, they're the ones providing the activities at, at home, but also the ambassadors and the bridging people to change our, or to bring this innovation and, and transformation to our home. It looks like this. It seems complicated, but it is not, okay? The dot points and the colors are the eight universities, so we have already integrated them in the model, but you can, Keep the idea and I will go through the each, each layer. We have changed the draw because uh, we show it to the advisory board and they said, this is an innovative model. And we said, yes. And they said, first, that you need to learn is you don't need an innovative model of governance. You need a, a model that works for what you want to do. And we say, really, we have forget the, the word innovation of the governance. But they found it very hierarchical. So we try with this picture not to be so, so much. Of course, we have a strategic level with the strategic board, with the rectors and one vice rector by, we have the student council also in the, we don't have it. This is what we are going to, to implement in October, okay? The strategic board, it's operative from the beginning. And the external advisory board uh, that are people that has had, they had a role in Europe uh, from governments or companies or uh, quality agencies. So this is one, uh, one responsibility, the strategic one. The, the more, transdisciplinary level with the knowledge creating team in the center. Uh, the knowledge creating teams are composed by academics, uh, students and external stakeholders around thematics. We started with water, food and life and health, but in the SWAF project, in the, in the research dimension, we have had inequalities, uh, environment, and I think another one, okay. Uh, but they are the center, the ones that need to keep us close to the societal challenges. Okay, so these are, they had a, a nuclear. And we have an external engagement committee because this is not so easy to explain to the externals what we want to do, how do we want to engage them. And um, also we have the executive board. This would be the, 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 the nuclear thing. One director per institution. To give you an example, is a full-time position, academic one, like a dean, okay? Imagine that we are building an interinstitutional faculty of our universities. So we need, we need someone that uh, has this as a full-time job, academic one. They have teaching and they have research, but 
Uh, so, and the third layer that is more, the more operational. Um, these are similar to the clusters that, uh, that uh, Emily explained. So we have the people from communication, we have the inclusivity uh, office, we have the mobility people, uh, we have the people from services, educational support. All of these uh, clusters are, uh, are integrated at one or two persons by each institution, and they act as the experts. Okay, so that they are giving support to the to the project, and we have some positions that are permanent. The Charmy office will be composed. By now, it was a financial person, a communication person, and myself. Okay, we are going to the the project managers that will not have this name anymore so we are going to just delete the work uh, project uh, we'd be part of the charming office also with responsibilities in thematic responsibilities in the alliance and we will uh, join a quality person we need hands for that and one person to look for calls and uh, help us to to find um complementary uh, funding okay so this is how it looks like, and for the end, uh, this was my personal view, no? Yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure. So uh, I think that one of the most important things or the most innovative uh, part of what we are doing is this, uh, that we are building and evolving together. This has a, a strength that not other projects that I have seen uh, have. At all levels, the partners, the alliances, the, the state members, that they are pushing each other now. Eh? Some are some are start financing. Some others are going. Some are flex, giving some flexibility on the on the educational rules. So and and. In, in terms of the group for you, I, I don't know that if the experience of Dana is the same, uh, as much as we experience, we are adjusting our needs, okay? Uh, the council recommendations about the European degree and the legal entity has been softened in the process of consultation and so on, but they are there. Uh, two years ago, I we, can, we could not imagine that this, was going to so far, okay? So I think we need to be very optimistic on that. There are many voices against this. If, if we are going to be funded in a competitive way, if we are elitist or not, uh, and this is my position, we are not funded as elitist. We are funded to be the icebreakers. That is hard. Change, change things is hard. Innovate is hard. So the others, the, our, our fight needs to be that the benefit is for all of the, the others, not only for us, okay? Uh, important, uh, in, the last, uh, in the last communications and so on, um, I think that if we or Europe try to marry legal entity with European degree, we are not going to progress uh, because it makes the threat of the member states come together. At the end, they don't want new actors with, uh, with more flexibility than can provide, uh, and it's, it's a personal view, okay? But co combining these two, it would be very difficult. Uh, tell me who was, when, what was one of the, of the alliances that think that we need to be able to award European degrees, but we are not there anymore. At the end, if Europe make something to make it um, easy, we will not need to do that because at the end, Charmio award is not the one that has the, the value. It's the University of Barcelona, Utrecht, Montpellier that are, uh, that are there. So, and for me, another important thing is that I have said it uh, many times. 
I understand that the that the state members have the autonomy of uh, all the educational part, and they are very jealous to not to lose that. Fine, but who rules the international part? Because if 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 they don't see some flexibility, they they cannot try to um, to rule these joint things. This is the problem of, of uh, smoothing the cooperation, okay? And, and the, the question is, what is the fear? What are they trying to avoid? If we understand what, what they, they're trying to avoid, maybe we can give some guarantees of that, okay? Because, uh, and maybe I am wrong because I am not an expert, but the other markets outside Europe don't have what we have. The students cannot move freely in different cultures and obtain a program or an award of different countries and different cultures. So I think this is a very important competitive advantage if we make it easy, okay? So this was my part. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Rachel. Again, yeah, very interesting, an eye-opener maybe. Um, keep your questions, make a note of them because we're gonna go first to Dana with her presentation and then we'll go back to questions for both uh, persons. You have the floor, Dana. Thank you. Hello everybody and um, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thank you, Meritzel, already for setting the, the floor. Um, I don't know if I should... Okay, you can change, uh, but maybe then. Um, so my name is Dana Samson. I'm uh, the Prorector for International Affairs at UC Louvain. I'm also part of the uh, management board of Circle U Alliance, and I'm the chair of the 4AU2 uh, subgroup for um, legal status and governance issues. So thank you. So I'm not going to go over this, which is what 4AU2 is about, because it's exactly the same as 4AU1. And in fact, um, we use the same terms of reference, and we call ourselves now the sister network of 4AU1. And I think it's very important because aspects of uh, legal status, governance, it's uh, relevant to all 41 alliances, not just the first wave or the second wave. And so it's really great that we have good connections between the two uh, uh, networks. So um, what about um, Circle U? So the history of Circle U, we are now um, nine universities, all uh, comprehensive research intensive universities. And it's not by chance that we are together. Six of us are already part of another network, which is called the Guild, uh, the Guild of Research Intensive Universities. And that has some influence also on the kind of form of governance and legal entity that we were looking for, because we were already used to be together uh, in um, many associations and especially um, the Guild. So um, we, um, like many other um, university alliances, I guess it might be the same for your alliances, we saw in this initiative something to build something for the future, well beyond the time span of the pilot phase. And so there's something about a strong commitment to try to do something together for the long term. And that again is something important because I guess that for most of us, we wanted to go beyond um, a project approach and really build some kind of new form of collaboration, irrespective of funding. For us at least, that was very clear when we committed to work together. Um, we choose, and I will go back to that, from the beginning, without not much discussion, in fact, the status of IESBL. And um, we had that in mind even before we submitted the proposal, and we got the status in um, March 2021. The Guild, which is that other association of which many of us were part, is also a kind of ISBL status. So it's something that we knew about and that played also an important role. So there are many legal statuses out there and uh, there are some on the national laws, some on the AU law. Not all are relevant for universities. Um, they have different characteristics. And so many 
um, universities and alliances have started to look into the details, trying to compare what those different uh, stages already bring, because before you want to invent something new, you can already start by looking what is already existing and is it fit for purpose. Um, and in doing so, when you look at the uh, dimensions, things that people are uh, careful about, yeah, you can change them, is our, um, are we going for something that is for profit or non-profit? Of course, first of all, you think in terms of universities, so you say non-profit, but of course, if you start to have other forms of model, you might be interested in something more large. Then, of course, you have to care about where the statutory seat is. You know that for some types of entities like ISBL or IESBL, you have to have uh, the statutory seat in Belgium, for example. And of course, if you don't have a Belgian university within your network, that might complexify things. Um, an important aspect is also what kinds of members are allowed, um, public entities, private entities. I know that this is something of a concern for some uh, university alliances because sometimes certain universities are private, other universities are public. Then, of course, people might be aware about the possibility of having non-EU members. Um, well, if you look at Circle U, we have King's College London, <laughs> not part of the EU anymore. <laughs> So then you start to think, well, you want something robust because we want to continue to work with kinks. Um, so it is important to know that the structure you're in has no um, constraints in terms of whether the, the participants can be from the AU or, or not. Another reason is also, you might be also with your alliances trying to think already about the global strategy. Of course, we are all concerned about Europe, but you know, the world is larger than Europe and uh, for Europe to survive, it's also to have good relations outside of Europe. So certainly at Circle U, the global um, aspect is important in terms of our collaboration. And so that can have also an impact on the kinds of uh, entity you look for. And then very pragmatically, everybody start to think how complex is it gonna be to go down that route? Because we have many other things to do as well. I mean, building our European alliances about joint degrees, about joint research. I mean, a lot of things we have to take care of. If in addition to that, we have a monster legal entity to deal with, uh, we lose probably uh, a lot of time at a very um, important stage of, uh, of the process. So we, at least at Circle U, we want something that is easy to set up, easy to manage, so very pragmatically. So um, we went for the IESBL status. Um, the reason first why we went for um, a legal entity was mainly to have it as a binding factor. So what we wanted, something that symbolically puts us together, that can show that we are together also to the outside world, and that can facilitate governance by being extremely transparent because that's what you do when you have a legal entity you have to define what are the governing bodies and you have to be very transparent about how the workings are and this is something that um, was important to us it was important and also easy because remember we knew already how isbl works because we use that in other networks and so it was not something that we didn't know anything about so the main reason that I said here, the binding factor has nothing to do with legal barriers. It's just that kind of binding trust between us and we believe that we are something. We are more than a project, we are an entity. There were also some reasons that we thought it would be interesting to have a legal entity which have a little bit more to do with legal obstacles. Um, one reason is to facilitate the fact of looking or seeking for joint funding. Uh, and for example, if you think of don donations, at that time we didn't even think that one day we would be eligible to go for AU funding as an ISBL. We can do that now, but we didn't know that it was possible at the time we set up as an ISBL. But we were thinking about donations of others that would be much more easier to um, uh, be managed through the ISBL because then it's a shared pot of money and you can dedicate it to shared projects. 
Um, the other aspect was um, the ability to uh, hire administrative staff. Although we haven't done that yet, I'll come to it uh, in a moment, but we see that there is um, an advantage of having this uh, legal entity for um, jointly hiring staff. So, um, we were first convinced that a legal status is a good thing to have, and we choose the ISBL, as I said, because we knew it, also because it's simple to set up. Um, it fulfills what we were looking for, and it also allowed us to include um, members that are not uh, part of the um, um, AU pilot project, because we like for Charm EU, extended. We extended to the University of Vienna and the University of Pisa, who were not there at the beginning, so they were not full members of the project that we submitted to the EU Commission, but they have become full members of the IESBL project, which means that we can work with them, they participate in our governance, even though they're not part of the uh, pilot phase as such. Um, our intention is to uh, hire administrative staff through the ISBL and also um, to have uh, some of the activities that we do that are directly funded by the ISBL, like for example, seed funding, or so things like that, which would be much easier to manage than having money circulating laterally between the members. Now, there are other obstacles that are very often talked about um, these are also obstacles that we face, but these are not obstacles at the moment that we try to overcome with the legal status. And that's why I think it's important to look at the relationship between having a legal status and legal obstacles. Sometimes the legal obstacles cannot be leveraged by a legal entity, and there might be other ways of solving the problem than having a dedicated legal entity. Um, so we know that it's, of course, difficult to uh, commonly hire research staff uh, and teaching staff for all sorts of human resources and human resources law, um, which uh, are quite uh, complex. What we took as a model, we have uh, designated what we call Circle U academic chairs. These are academic staff members who are fully remaining appointed at their home institutions, but they can um, dedicate 20% of their time for Circle U projects. So basically, they're not hired by a joint structure. They're hired by their home institution, but the home institution allows them to spend 20% of their time for the collective good. So they could go and teach somewhere else or, or whatever. It has a good advantage because these uh, academic staff members keep all their um, resor um, um, human resources advantages from their home uh, country. They have the same advantage as they had before and as their neighbors. So there's no inequity within uh, a single university. It's simply that um, they are in a way uh, able to, um, the authorities, accept that they spend 20% of the time um, for the, the, the joint alliance. So far we have 45 chairs and this is going to increase. So in a rolling model, we would have more than 100 uh, a year that would be uh, involved. We choose that format because academic staff do teaching and research and we needed to find a model for activities uh, within the alliance to be both teaching and research and also how these two go together. In terms of delivering teaching, we are not yet as ambitious as the model you want to test with Charm EU at the moment. We use each our home learning management systems and try to find a way to help our students navigate through that. And we use classic agreements for joint degrees with all the hurdles that you have to go through to do that. But um, we do not yet run it uh, through our legal entity might change one day, but at the moment, we don't go that, down that route yet. This is um, our management um, structure. What you see in blue is actually the governance, and that's the long-term governance. Um, what you see in um, red, it's the projects. 
what we decided early on is that all the projects that we submit, Erasmus strategic partnerships, the, the pilot phase, the age 2020, any future project that we run will be referring to the blue part and run by the IESBN. It's also easy in the grant agreement because in the grant agreement, when you have to fill in what do you do in terms of management, we use our ISBL structure. One main advantage for that is that we have an overview of all the projects. We make sure that it's coherent, that we don't go in completely di different directions, that we have the same synergy and that we have complementary project, et cetera, et cetera. So in the blue part, we have a classic, you've heard it probably from um, Una Europa as well, although the composition of the bodies are different between Una Europa and CycleU. At the, the General Assembly, we have the uh, rectors of the nine universities, and we have also two student representatives of our student union. We have um, a management board, and the management board is composed of the pro-rectors or vice-rectors of each university, plus the project coordinator of each university. Then we have a um, general secretary. And just to give another example of how we, we go with the legal uh, obstacles, the general secretary is hired through UC Louvain, but detached through an agreement to the ISBL. So, um, in terms of human resources, he has to follow the laws of UC Louvain, but in terms of his mission and activities, he, it is agreed and also put in law that um, he does his activity under the leadership of um, the president of Circle U. So it's a way to, um, to deal with that. And you don't need a legal entity, in fact, to do that. Those kinds of det detachments can be done even without legal entities. What is very important for us is, of course, the student involvement. They are involved in the General Assembly. They have their own um, student union, and they also participate in the work package management of each of the projects. Okay, I think that's the main thing. Okay, and then now to the question about legal status. We know that there is a long list of legal barriers and many universities have already given a list to their politicians and said look this is what is difficult to do now those legal barriers in terms of teaching and whatever we have to deal already now in terms of our international collaboration with them but the problem with the european alliances is that we do so much so many more collaborations that it becomes even more time consuming to solve all those problems. Of course, there's always a solution that you can find for each single one, but you spend your day solving uh, barriers. That's what is becoming um, an obstacle to the, de to the development of um, European uh, alliances. So, for example, in teaching, we know that there are some restrictions in national laws, not in all countries, but in some countries, about when the start, when the term should start, uh, about the content of the programs, the fees, etc. In terms of mobility, we know and that's another area that has nothing in, anymore to do with education, but we know already that in certain uh, countries, if you spend more than three months outside of um, the country, you have problem with your social security, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all that are problems daily, in daily life uh, when you do intensive international collaborations. So my point is, when people talk about legal um, statuses, Katie, you're next. Yeah. Doesn't want to. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I think there are two aspects that we could look at. The first one is. How do we approach things to solve problems? On the one hand, we could take individual negotiations. We each go and see our government and say, hey, I want more flexibilities in terms of fees. Can you not change the, league, the, the national law for this to happen? And of course, Circle U, we are nine universities, which means that nine countries have to change or adapt their national laws to uh, overcome the, the, the problems. That's one approach. The other approach is a global approach. 
we try to put all the member states together, believe in the ambitions of the European Alliance and commonly agree that they will find a way to adapt or give exceptions to the national laws that are exceptions. So either it's a coordinated way or we just have to lobby one-to-one. -one. That's in terms of approach. The second question you can ask yourself is on the scope. What do we do? Are we going to tackle narrow and independent legislation? Because I'll give you two examples. One is about um, the degrees, the joint degrees or what the European degrees. But well, that has nothing to do with the mobility and the tax and uh, the um, HR, pension and all that of all the professors that are going to move from one country to the other. So we could battle to try change in either an individual or in a global way for specific areas of legislation. Or we take here as well a global approach, a global scope, and we say we should find the miracle solution for all the activities of European uh, universities. If we really want that um, European universities are driving forces, do something really transformative for the uh, EU, then we have to remove the hurdles and we should remove all the hurdles. And I guess when people think about, should we have a new European university legal status? There's the idea behind that it may help that status may help to have the global approach and the global scope. But I don't think that we've convinced yet that this is an um, efficient way because it might take a long time to get there. And will it deliver? Will it be effective or not? This is an open question. So I think where we are up to now is to really put the pro and cons of is it really through a legal entity that we will manage to solve all the legal obstacles? We are all convinced that we have to solve the obstacles. I think nobody contests that. Um, the question is how to solve those legal uh, obstacles and whether a, a single uh, legal entity for a, a European alliance will be the way forward. And I guess this is, will be a point of discussion. <laughs> Maybe, um... Thank you so much. Um, let's uh, let's yeah let's Q and A and and talk a bit more. Um, Pedro couldn't be here today, but I think this is kind of I have a dream idea as well. I have a dream of this new university and working together and jointness and whatever. So I, I'm hopeful we're going to reach this. And yeah, Pedro, sorry you couldn't be here. Anyway, um, let's let's have a a, a chat, and uh, maybe I'm going to start with two questions and then turn to uh, uh, everybody else. Um, well, two models again. One model I kind of know quite well. Uh, ASCBL is, is kind of kindred, so it's the same, it's just another language to the one we're doing, the non-for-profit, so that's kind of the thing I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to. Why the, the, the I in international was like may, maybe a very stupid small question, because I understood that we didn't need the international one anymore, because it's not limited to the, an, a, a fixed number of national uh, nationals like Belgian people or, or companies or partners that are involved. So why did you choose for, uh, for, for this I? Is it because of the non-European partners maybe you want to affiliate? So um, in fact, the I was symbolically, one, one aspect is symbolically because it's international, which means that actually the scope of activities is by essence international, which is actually the purpose of the European universities. And the second one is because this was the, out of the two, the one that was most, most flexible in terms of what we can put as content in terms of governance. The ISBL is quite flexible as well. But the uh, ESBL is even a little bit more. And so, well, it's international. It's even more flexible. We knew it. We go for it. <laughs> so, so maybe we made a mistake. Don't tell anybody. Um, we, we just signed it a couple of months ago. <laughs> um, and Merit, I listened to your um, kind of model, and it makes perfect sense. Is there a difference in 
the, the, the glueness of, of it all, because we've been talking about this jointness and during lunch we talked about it's a way of getting together identity. It could be like a hobby club, people going fishing together. You need a name, you need some kind of entity, and then you've got like a t-shirt and you feel like part of a unity. Is this something you're, you're missing within your model or do you feel like for us it's just the same? I think it's the first reason now and the one that we go straight for the governance and we have not decided for the legal entity because we need this all, all the items that uh, the, uh, she, she said. I mean, it's a need. You cannot manage this or you cannot govern this like it was in the first years. So no, the, the reasons are the same. We are so more cautious about the, the, the association, the association or the legal entity of any kind. Thank you. Um, turning to you, is there an extra mic? Um, I love to run all day, but it's going to be hard. <laughs> Challenging. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the, the presentations. I um, actually have uh, uh, two questions that are, uh, one is for, for both, because one was uh, uh, um, a thing that really puzzled me. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentations. It was really interesting to see our alliances in the first wave are dealing with things we are concerned in with in the second wave, and at the same time to see how similar the problems are. But my first question has to do with something that uh, Merrick Stell said, which is this idea of the marriage between the, the legal uh, entity and the European degree. And that takes us to something that Dana also mentioned, which is, and that was also in the, the other presentation, which is, should this legal entity deal with degree awarding? And I got, because we never thought of that. So for us, and we've talked a lot, like I suppose we've all had about this legal entity, we never even thought of the possibility of this entity awarding degrees. And we had a conversation about the issue of micro-credentials and the possibility of using this entity to provide for international certifications in certain veins, but never degrees. My question is, when you talk of this marriage, do you actually see any advantage in having an entity such as the ones that we've been talking about awarding degrees? Because I, I, for me, there are no, absolutely no advantages whatsoever. So I cannot even imagine why this is being discussed and why it's on the, the, the agenda. And, uh, um, and my, my second question is somewhat related. It has to do with the, the, the governance model that both of you presented where hiring staff becomes a, a, a competitive advantage the moment you are able to do it on an international level. While in some of the, the research we did uh, when preparing the, the, our governance model and, and preparing this entity, one of the things we were confronted with is that that hiring of staff, and I'm not talking of research and teaching staff, I'm not talking of offices, actually that is a disadvantage because attracting talented people using an entity no one knows about that has no track record and that is really hard to position in terms of the social security systems like it was mentioning then it becomes a disadvantage to use this legal entity so i was kind of puzzled why both of you mentioned it as a possibility so those were my points okay in the, in the first case the think about the be able to award degrees was coming from the difficulty of the accreditation, mainly, okay? And other matters, for example, and, and maybe, so I think there are two solutions, or there are some things that are ruled by Europe, for example, the fees, okay? It's a nightmare. And you cannot compare the fees with your national programs. We are, we are in another uh, market, different. We are not competing with a student that wants to stay forever in Budapest and is paying very low fee. We, we, we need to, um, to achieve something that is inclusive, but it's an example. So the, the, the first idea was coming saying, we are not going to be able to do that, trying to fill the national legislations of the partners. If we have five, um, eight or nine, um, it's impossible. If the movement is to make each national legislation more flexible, for example, in Spain, it was a, a big 
uh, change, okay? Produced by, by the, because we were the first uh, program in the market, but they, 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 they said, okay, things that never happened before, that you can do the parchment that in Spain is hyper secure with the paper that is like the money. Uh, they said, it would be as the uh, consortium agreement determines, or in, in, in Spain, they have moved the legislation again to 240 in the bachelors, forbidden 180. In the same legislation, they say, okay, the joint programs can go for 180. So if the state members move in this direction, the, the, the difficulties will blow up. So uh, this is why we, are, we have changed our mind. In, in this, but the, the, the reason at the beginning was that one. You want to answer that? Okay. Just on, on that aspect, perhaps to, to say that um, at Circle U, the moment we don't think of delivering teaching through the entity either, it's really two separate things. And I guess um, it again comes down to how do you solve the legal barriers? Is it through the legal entity or through? changing making legislation more flexible and it's two different things we have to separate the two debates uh, i think so um, there are ways of um, uh, facilitating joint degrees that do not require that european consortium i only recognize if they have a certain type of legal entity and i don't think from what i heard even from dg EAC or other that the um, where they go to is to impose a kind of legal entity to the European university. And we should continue to fight to be free to choose whatever suits us best for the purpose. But perhaps some alliance will see an advantage to have a legal entity that can deliver um, a joint diploma. So there might be advantage to that. And I hope it's not gonna be something that is uh, that we're obliged to do. However, probably we all would benefit if there's more flexibility in the national regulations to do joint degrees. But I put the marriage is because as the two things are in the same, uh, in the same council recommendations and so on, uh, I think some uh, member states are linking both. And this is the worst we can, uh, it can happen because they will block the, the, the this, this was my point, not, not because I think we need it. We thought at the beginning as the only way out. You know. And the other, you want to answer the other, the hiding? The hiding, yeah. So I guess it's a, a, again the same. Our approach is very pragmatic in terms of hiring. So we don't look, I think it's you who said it at some point in other conversations that we're not looking for a legal entity for the sole purpose of having a legal entity, the legal entity should be there to facilitate certain things. What we saw, it's actually um, um, more transparent to have a structure where we can hire administrative staff, especially when you have a model with a secretary general, et cetera, et cetera. So that's easy to locate it in an entity that is neutral towards any other university because symbolically it's more shared. And then once you take that as a starting point, you have to find whatever financial model will help to achieve that. And here, for example, the fact that in the um, next call, for those in the second wave, and for you in this, uh, uh, this call, you can apply as a legal entity to have direct money coming from the AU to the entity is something good because you, don't, you have less money transactions. Um, it goes directly to the ISBL and the ISBL can then hire whatever is the minimum a joint administrative staff that you want to have and where you want to make sure that they are not more attached to one university than another. That was the, 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 the reason for us. And for, in our case, it's, it's uh, more for administrative staff, okay? Because it's the one that can be, we, we have uh, in total, I, I mentioned that four people or so, so not, not far from, from Yuna and, and, and myself. Now each of these person is paid by one university. But when we have tried to find someone for quality to share the cost of this person, it's a nightmare also to try to find how to do that. Okay, so 
uh, I think this is very instrumental. In the case of the academic staff, we think we don't need it because I, I, I know better the, the Spanish case, but uh, it's easy to share the academic staff and to give them mandates of 20% to do that and collaboration with the universities. In the case of administrative staff, this is very difficult. Okay, and for example, one other problem that we had is, uh, okay, we can uh, we can hire each of us 20% of administrative to do the job, but you cannot do that at home. You can, it's not so easy to, 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 to obtain 20% of an administrative person if you don't hire another one. So uh, it's also, uh, it's also logistics again. Well, as, as a follow-up, maybe I'm, I'm, since we just signed it a couple of months ago, I'm, I'm kind of uh, wondering how we should proceed with admin people coming in to run the uh, ACLB, because at this moment it's kind of dormant, it's not really doing anything. Should we tackle this during this design phase already, or just like stay put and, and see what happens? I mean, maybe Dana, you got an idea because you hired people already doing kind of day-to-day -day work on, on the uh, ASBL. So th there are different ways of, uh, of doing it. So um, at the beginning, and it's still the moment now, we have no money running through the ISBL. So the easiest is to detaching people to work for the ISBL. That's the model that we, we took. As we can get money coming into the ISBL, and there can be different ways of doing that with an ISBL. You can have donations, you can have AU funding, you can have membership fees. So there's a lot of way to do it in a very transparent and legal way to have money coming in. Um, once we have that set up, then of course the options become bigger because you can detach people, but also directly hire people. And that's the model that most association, university association use. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think we, as, as I said, now we don't have the legal entity. So we have the people contract by each institution, okay? Uh, the joint virtual administrative office, that is the other example that I give you with people full-time doing something, uh, it's part of the game because it has been very interesting to see how to manage a group of people uh, sharing the same type of job, but depending from a person at home, okay? So uh, about uh, holidays or even about responsibilities. So what well, are you not, not doing that? Oh, because they, I was told not to do that, okay? So uh, I think this is, again, a, a challenge of management. At a management level, you can work on that, okay? But I think the, 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 these hiring costs and, and also maybe to have the same conditions for the people, it's good too, because it's uh, difficult to, uh, I would put an example. The, one of the first uh, informal things that these people of the Joint Virtual Office uh, did is to compare the number of holidays they have. Number one, the woman in the French unit, 52, okay? And in the other, uh, in the other extreme was Trinity with 22 in the whole year. So uh, this is our, our, our stupid matters, but the laboral uh, climate also affects these uh, small things. Of course, it also happened with, with academic staff. So the conditions on how, how many hours it counts in your university for each contact hour and the preparation time and how part, which part of your load is considered or not, there are also big difference among us. No? But we are, I think the, the academic staff is more, more used to, it's easier with this, with this case. And the other thing in the legal entity that, that Dana doesn't mention specifically is the, the IT systems. We, are, we, we will go for some IT systems uh, all together. And how are we going to, and this is, this is uh, money. How do you contract that with the aliens? Who is going to do the, the, how it's called, the, the public uh, the, tender. the tender, okay, mm -hmm. for example. Okay, questions, there are questions, two questions. Thank you for sharing. Um, suppose we do not arrive into a legal status, 
and the global approach scope for the European University Initiative, and we keep solving the micro problems on our own wing, I suppose. My pro provocative question is, what is the real difference between what we now call European universities and what we have been doing in the last 20 years in terms of collaboration between universities? So what is the big difference between university, the future, as Emily said, and what we've been doing until now? Who wants to go first? <laughs> I think the, the, the difference is just a the scale of the collaboration. I mean, we all have strategic partnerships, uh, had them in the past, but at least for us, we never did as many different things with the same partners and with so many partners at the same time. So it's really, I would say the, 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 the first thing is the scale of the collaboration. And secondly, we are now on a trip where we are asked to invent new stuff so we do forms of collaborations that we never did before either and so this is going to come again with some probably obstacles on the one hand they say look you are driving force for europe you should invent transform uh, we should move fast and, and be good at what we do but on the other hand as we try to do that because you know you are in universities people have lots of fantastic ideas we are creators so it's not a problem for us to invent new stuff but then you just get bogged down by admin stuff and days after days you have a big dream and then you say oh no I can't I cannot do that because there's silly little things that doesn't work so I guess the power and maybe that's why people are, get captured also by that debate about legal entity is to say maybe we can dream out of the box and there's going to be something that erases all the obstacles a full white page where people really believe in us and they just say you want to do a joint degree with nine fine you do it and we cover everything in terms of legal matters so there's something about that it's um you know the, the whole initiative of european universities uh, touched our imagination about what we could do and we know that there are barriers that we have to overcome and maybe the, the next dream is to find a way to to get rid of those uh um barriers but perhaps it's not a legal status maybe someone will come up with another idea of something that can also solve the problems and that's what we're looking for yeah i i will support a lot the idea of the will the purpose i think the glue of all of us even between <laughs> alliances is that uh, all of us think that we are we are doing something for the future uh you don't have many opportunities to just say out of the box in charm we said the word impossible is out so this is a unique opportunity this is one second long-term commitment when you you go for a three years project uh after these three years you decide who do you want to follow or don't and i can ensure and you know already that there are moments that you would just blow the alliance because uh, there are tensions. Uh, but you know that this is this is going to last. So you you look how to solve that problem. And the third maybe is that we have not been completely free to choose the partners because we we were expected to have diversity. So maybe you don't want, you you never expect to work with some universities but they bring diversity and they bring uh, tolerance and learning how others uh, think, how manage, how, how values they have and respect them. And I think this is different from a, a, a normal project, I think. I think time is nearly up. A small question, do we have a mic? <laughs> Thank you very much for the interesting presentations. I have a question related to the four EU working groups. So you're both chairs of one of the working groups. Uh, and I wonder if there is more into these working groups. Now it's really trying to talk with one voice and discussing the barriers and the topics, but we really act as independent European university alliances. Do you see potential in more, like even collaboration then on the level of, of for you, 
so it's yeah again a, a level more so to complicate it even more at, at which level of complication uh yeah of yeah you can choose the level of complication so it's can we collaborate more than having this discussion on the topics is it also a possibility then that you have also collaborations on the level of the European universities. They are there already. Okay. I put you an example. Uh, there are three or four alliances that we are trying to be together to build something on IT or, or get the profit of some developments of Balkan University with the others. Uh, so not the whole group for everything, but uh, there are a lot of uh interactions or um for this european degree we are thinking of uh, having some alliances working together and not trying to so become i think we are there already uh, at least is my impression okay in the legal entity thing is not so easy because it's something very special and and very in the core of the of the governance of the alliance but I think that, that in many other uh, things, we are already there. Yeah, just to add perhaps that we can certainly go a layer further in sharing practice and thoughts. And a good example is legal entities, because you can see that um, there's a span really of uh, views on it from alliances that do not see the need to have a legal entity to some who have a very precise idea of what it should be to those who don't want a EU law uh, entity, others that want a EU law entity. So there's a lot of diversity and we have to foster that. We have to ensure that there's place for everybody to evolve um, with their specific needs. And in that sense, um, we are an important contact point also for all people, DGA, I can uh, somewhere else about showing the diversity also. So we should not necessarily, to, I mean, it's also sometimes good not to agree on everything, <laughs> but we have to give a, a honest portrait of where we're up to uh, now. Um, so I guess those discussion areas are very important beyond also concrete collaboration that can be with, uh, within uh, some alliances. We, we have done position papers together that all the alliances have signed, for example, and this is important because at the end, there are 280 universities saying that thing. So it's important. There is another proposal, for example, that was in the other in the governance uh, forum that we have in uh, a Dutch uh, person uh, that was not from European Alliance saying, you have a unique opportunity as Bologna was to establish uh, interoperability in IT systems and uh, be free of the, of the private companies because they are looking for these matters and this would be very expensive. And you have the possibility to give the criteria and, and do like, like Bologna agreement on doing something together not together saying we are going, no, for, for some criteria for interoperability that will can easy. So I think this is happening. Thank you. I think we, we no, we don't need a coffee break. I think we need to discuss this uh, ongoing. Uh, it will, is there a difference be, between for you one and, and two in this kind of working because, yeah. yeah. 17 and they are for, yeah. Yeah. And that's the only difference because I just kind of joined. In, in two, of course, as we're the second wave, and uh, I feel something is going on that maybe you've, you've got more established um, connections and relationships already. I think we are working quite together in almost everything. I think we have maybe different subgroups. You have more than we, I think, but yeah, but no, I don't see. And they, there is a lot of cross, yeah. cross activity. Yeah, I think that we are at, um, at different stages also, like here, it was mainly responding to the call now, we are going to be in that situation next year, so there are little differences, but otherwise the approach is the same, and I think it's really important, the points, and it's a case for me to thank Marek Sel, who reached out to our group as well to say, come on, let's find a way to keep in touch and know what's happening in one and the other network, which I think is really great, so thank you. <laughs> But at the end, we, we have talked about to come together mm. now because there is this 
a first uh, differential gap, but this would be out in one year, maybe, or something. And have a board between the two of you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dana. Thank you, Maricel.